when someone says A is better than B for hypertrophy, it gets my eyeball because for hypertrophy, it's really hard to say A is, is different from B for, for hypertrophy. Of all of the variables that we have, this is actually one of the areas where the research is a little bit more consistent. Welcome to the N1 Experience, brought to you by N1 Education, the leader in fitness education. All right, everybody, we are back again here for part two with Dr. D'Souza, and we are going to continue the conversation on volume and actually make it to the long muscle length topic today. So we finished off starting to go through some of the details of the, the Ennis paper, and we talked about ecological validity of the high volume studies and whether or not we think it's important to be measuring more muscles. And the next kind of question I have regarding the volume research and specifically on the two studies that we'll talk about from your lab today are the extradized standardization. So you guys used a optional high bar and low bar squat. So can you give me kind of an explanation of why you went with that and whether there was a, a randomization of that among the groups? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Thanks for having me again. It seems you want to lose some followers, but that's fine, right? That's on you. But no, that's a great question, Cass. So usually, and after we will talk about this, I, was, I went to the paper like, whoa, we always assume that people, you understand what we did in the paper. And sometimes things are clear to us because I always tell students like, we need to write for the audience and for the reviewers, because we know what happened. We need to make the things, the things are as clear as possible. And I realized that we don't put a too much description of exercise, range of motion, those kind of things. And like a man, we, the paper is under review. Once it gets, it comes back. We really want to put a description about range of motion for leg press, knee extension, so on and so forth. But uh, so usually what we do, especially for the squat, that there is a, a important skill component. It's always like a feet placement, like a regardless exercise, but like a squat, because the skill component, we don't want to, we don't want the participants changing their technique. So it's really up to them about the position, the placement for the barbell grip when it comes to bench press or foot placement when it comes to leg press, for example. And once they, they, that's what they're going to do, we're going to keep that consistently across the study throughout the whole duration. So again, it, it's a good because we know that on, on, on the high or low bar position for the squat, we might be able to emphasize a little bit more or less different muscle groups. But again, randomization usually should account for these differences in technique across individuals because they're going to be randomly assigned to different groups. And we, based on that, we assume that we supposed to have the same number of people with a high low bar position across the groups. But usually again, once they, that's the technique, we don't change technique, body control, pretty much range of motion because for the squat. We test them and for parallel squat, like a hundred degrees knee flexion. So usually they train with the same setup because we kind of, I don't like to say box squat because we use like a, some plates or sometimes you just use like a less bent and, and giving them a reference. That's a range of motion you should tap. Once you tap, you go up and then we, we control range of motion throughout exercise. So go leg press, 90 degrees, hundred degrees knee flexion. The knee extension, usually 90, 95 degrees, like a from knee flexion all the way to extension, but we don't change technique, especially for free weight exercises and exercises that have that technique compound, the skew, we don't change it. Okay. Yeah. Cause the, the reason I ask is that we're, we're looking at, we're looking for that inverted U is if we're using a technique that say isn't as quad biased. Well, that's going to come a lot later in that absolute, that absolute volume number. So with the consideration being trying to keep their technique, do you think that then is a limiter in that if we looked at the average, like how quad biased 
was the squat technique. And me, like my demographic does very biased exercises. And focusing on deep and lengthened range of motion is becoming more popular. And I think it's important to, the thing I want the most out of most studies I read is more in the methods to actually understand the exercise. Because it's like, okay, if people are getting to 95 degrees in their leg extension, that's cool. But my leg extension is set up so that you can get significantly deeper than that. And so it's okay. Does that maybe mean that there's a slightly greater fatigue component if on average you're training at a little bit more range of motion or a little bit longer lengths than what we have in the study? Or for example, if you're biasing more quads versus hips over, so if you're doing a leg press technique where your foot is really, really low versus if you're doing it like, so, and if we talk about one of the, I think the study that adds the hip thrust in, they actually included the pictures of how they performed the leg oh. press. And it's like, okay, well, in that leg press, potentially the quad still would have been a limiter in that similar to the squat that may be partly why they experienced the results that they did. So that's kind of where I'm coming from with this. And so I guess now that we have the explanation, do you think that there's possible that that is influencing how high of a number we're getting by not, in, instead of using their current squat form, by not using exercises where we can make sure the quadriceps are absolutely and always the limiter, but there's a potential for some subjects that maybe with the squat form or the other form that these exercises are a little bit more balanced or maybe a little bit like in some cases, somebody's squat might even be a little hingy biased. If you're assuming that technique is a B, maybe it's yes, right? Uh, I, I agree. If you have a low foot position for leg press versus high or high versus low for barbell position, and you compare two groups in that scenario, we should find some differences. I, I agree for that. Uh, how that impacts the, 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 the study findings, again, like the, the, the example you gave me about the picture for the hip thrust study was just one participant. And, and sometimes, yes, we only put one participant in the picture. But uh, I, I think those, because of randomization, uh, I think those differences would be diluted across the groups. I definitely agree that if you compare technique A versus B, depending on the technique you talk about it right now, that seems to be a hot topic as well. So the, the technique, but uh, I think the randomization, that's why you randomize the groups. Usually it's a blind process. So for me, usually we randomize based on all the most important dependent variables. So Quite often, that's the, the studies, and I keep telling this as well, that the studies for the volume studies, they are, they are more suitable when it comes to look at hypertrophy, not too much strength because the rep range you are using is not, not so specific. That's because we started to do high, low reps, but it's still, I don't think specific for a strength training athlete or someone who has a goal to increase maximum strength. So I agree. Uh, your, and your point is very good. Definitely, I think adaptations across techniques, the examples you gave me, should be different. But it try to dilute those differences through randomization. As I was saying, like what we do about randomization. So for me, it's like a, after we measure muscle size, because that's quite often the, the most important dependent variable. We rank participants from largest muscle to smallest one. And then they're going to be randomly we are blinded and we're going to randomly allocate them to different groups. But I, again, that should account for the difference in techniques. But it is one more. Again, can you say the limitation about in our studies? Maybe yes. I think the biggest limiting factor, it, it gets hard to compare studies sometimes, right? Because we don't know if they're comparing apples to apples or orange or apples to orange. So I agree that within a study, we are able to dilute those differences through randomization. Between studies, that would be nice, like a find a way to look at that as, is that a moderated factor impacting the outcomes you are investigating? 
But again, that's how I see it. Mm -hmm. So I agree that the different technique might play a role if you're comparing different techniques. But within a study, randomization should account for that. The downside, it, it gets hard when you're comparing studies. Now, when you say randomization should account for it, you're hoping that basically we get a, a balanced distribution between groups. Is that ever, is that, because I, I don't see that in most of these papers where they present, oh, on average, sometimes they will. There will be like a, a individual variance thing or whatever. They say, well, on this group, you know, the average height was this and this one and give those differences between groups. So are you looking at that after the, like after you guys have randomized the groups, are you double checking to make sure there's a, like a similar distribution? Okay. Awesome. Yeah. It's still, awesome. So what do we do? We have a good point. Like uh, usually what do we do? Once we randomize the groups based on that variable, we got to look at height, body weight, everything else. And then if you see some difference, we going to redo randomization and, and, and again, okay, now put everything blind again, randomize once more. But usually like a height, it should be an important component to talk about a spot, but usually the studies, uh, most of studies, they test for differences when it comes to anthropometric factors, not just the main outcome of interest, but also we check for body weight or height to see an age as well. So usually those three, we also look at to see if there is any difference. The, the recent squat versus hip thrust study with Daniel Plotkin was the lead author. We had a discussion on that. And then we have a private discussion on all the different ways that we could try and track anthropomorphics without it being a privacy issue, which unfortunately I think is a over-restrictive limitation in publications right now in terms of, because especially small tangent here, but with the abilities that we're getting with AI, it's like, man, if we had anthropomorphics and stuff for these individual data points, and then we get to the point where we could have a computational model start looking for signals that were oh, yeah. related, like that would be super cool, but it's like, okay, but those, that, those data points don't, don't exist. So what they for did example, is they, when, when they did the, the, uh, my PhD with a periodization and I had, I have a, uh, all the femur lamps for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Like I like that's the information I would love. So the idea that we had that they actually ended up doing was, is they put out silhouettes for all of the participant squatting. And I think that's, uh, that, that was cool to see, but also it's, oh, some people are like, well, you know, they looked at that, like, oh, these squats are this or that, or like this, so there's going to be all these opinions yeah. about it or whatnot. And so some people will look at that and they'll look at it very analytically. And some people will find, hey, if there's one person in here that's squatting, not that great, they're going to be like, yep, look, the study's all garbage because this person's doing a what, what quarter can, squat. I think. Some things that we have been trying to do, and, and I think uh, other, I always feel bad trying to give a device to people what they're supposed to do, whatever. I don't think I'm in such a position yet, so I don't think I'm going to be there one day. But what we, because the challenge in here is we have a, like, a, we have a body weight right, for, for the, the, the last study. You have like a body weight, fat percentage. We have a local fat free mass muscle thickness, maximum strength, and reps to failure. So we talk about five, six variables, at least like uh, at the beginning. And when you're going to randomize, we do a uh, balanced randomization. When you use one variable to randomize the groups, the other variables don't follow. And then not because they said, like I said, and people are going, oh, that's garbage because the, that variable is different. That might impact. What we can do as a researchers is always, and I have been trying to do that, is using some baseline variables as a co-variate, so co-variables to see, and that's something we always can do. I have been doing that last, I don't know, we did a study, nobody talks too much about it because a lot of people assume that is lower eccentric, it would generate more hypertrophy, but we saw more distal hypertrophy with a faster eccentric. And we had information from previous training, and I used that information as a covariate to see if those variables would impact the measurements we did about hypertrophy and strength. So that's something that researchers can do, like always using body weight, height. You can always use it. I'm not using those variables. I'm using other variables, but we always can check if that variables impact. 
the measurements of hypertrophy or the strength. That's something we can always do, but we don't do quite often. Yeah, I mean, I will never complain about having too much in terms of the in terms of the data points and, and the methods. I coming from yeah. a biomechanics background, that just happens to be the lens that I look through a lot of these studies. I know some people can get way more into the statisticals analysis of it and looking at the errors and stuff like that way better than I can. Where my expertise lies in is looking at, okay, what considerations are there in terms of a individual leverages or the physics of the way the exercises were done, et cetera. Um, uh, do, do, yeah, yeah, we should integrate more and, and it's hard to integrate biomechanics, physiologies, yeah. but I, I agree for you. We, we are, I think we scientists, we have a, the bias that in science, less is more. And this have so many variables that the end, what is the main question of this paper? There are so many mm -hmm. things they measure or are the researchers, because we also get criticized, oh, they're measuring so many things to see where they're gonna find difference mm -hmm. and it gets yeah. easier to, to publish the paper. Mm -hmm. But I, I agree with you, those, those variables, that especially the biomechanical factors, they yeah. play an important role when it comes to adaptations and things you are looking at. But it goes back to the part one conversation that quite often we need to isolate one variable, right? Range of, we talk about volume only or just manipulating range of motion. But sometimes we know that in practical settings, we not only manipulate only volume, only, only range of motion, but to pinpoint what's causing what, we, that's how we try to do it. <laughs> yeah. And another example is when it comes to machines that have some sort of cam or something. There's, there's the Pedrosa studies in the leg extension, and then the author is blanking me right now on oh, that happens, you know. what was it with, for the, the seated versus lying leg curl. I'm terrible about this. Seated thing. lying leg. Ah, that was the that, mile, the, right? Mile? mile, mile yeah, I th yeah, I think that might've been a mile. There, there's so many now I can't keep track so of. Many, you see, I'm right? so bad at pronouncing those names and also I get. Yeah, whereas that's it's like. That's an important point, like the setup of each exercise, right? Mm -hmm. it, yeah, I would love to know if the lying leg curl and the seated leg curl had the same resistance profile of the machine, or because that's a that's an important element. Anyway, well, what moving do you on. Think? What do I think? Um, well, if I have to guess, I would say most times the universities aren't splurging on the most expensive equipment, and that equipment tends to have a fairly linear cam system. So that if I had to guess like by probabilities, I would uh -huh. guess that neither of them had a very strong drop off or whatnot versus if you're going to, the more expensive equipment is where we tend to see cams that are meant to match the strength curve or, of the exercise and stuff or of the muscle exercises don't have strength curves. But so that, that would be my guess, but I have no idea. Cause I mean, I, there, yeah. there, there's a gazillion different cams out there. Everybody that's worked out at different gyms or worked out at a hotel, you like, you get on a machine and it doesn't feel the same. And one of the reasons for those machines is that have different resistance profiles in addition to handles or padding, et cetera. Um, anyway, okay. We can get back to that when we get into, I think some of the actual, those studies on long muscle length, but to wrap up our volume thing. So you have an unpublished study that is a slightly different way of looking at higher volumes compared to the NS study. So do you want to kind of summarize that study and the results? And then I want to look at like converging that information with the NS study and what your overall takeaways are between those two and how that fits in our overall understanding of this volume question. All right. That's, that's okay. I'm going to spoil my paper now, but it's fine. <laughs> okay. So just some background about the paper. I think uh, I always keep saying that when it comes to study trained individuals, we need to account for what they were doing before they study. It, it is, again, we're going to get into to range of motion. But for me, especially the Brigade study, when they found that two groups, the, high, the higher volume, 32 and 24 weekly sets, they had the greatest hypertrophic gains. And not too much or nothing was not statistical, statistically different for the 16 weekly sets. 
However, the 16 weekly sets was the only group that dropped their volume compared to what they were doing previously. And the 24 and 24 and 32, they increased their volume compared to what they were doing previously. So for the first study we had with the all day study, what we did, we randomized them based upon their previous training volume. Okay, let's, and I always had that in mind. We need, to, we're going to do that study first, and then you're going to do a follow-up study to account for something else. So what we did with uh, all day study was we randomized all the participants based upon the weekly set number they were doing before. So they always started with, they had the same baseline, the same start line. The weekly set, average weekly set was 12, 13 across the three groups. And we did not find any differences between 12, 18, 24 for hypertrophy. We had something interesting for the strength. So we still, when we look at that, one issue was a, some people, regardless the group, some people dropped the volume. So again, I keep saying whether or not difference for previous volume and what they are doing in the study is a confounding factor. We need more studies, but I think in a good randomized study, we need to account for all potential confounding variables. So regardless of the group there, even the 24 set group, some people was the higher volume, but some people there, they were reducing the volume compared to what they're doing before. And I think, again, for me, it's like, a, okay, we accounted for one thing. Now let's do the next step. We had the study from the senior is Clayton Libarge, big researcher as well. So the Scarpelli study, he was the senior and Maida was the, the PI where they had the one group with a fixed volume, 22 weekly sets, and the other group that increased 20% was a within subject design. So that was the first study that no condition decreased the volume compared to what they're doing before. So then that's what he wanted to do with the follow-up study. Hey guys, now let's do one thing. We're going to randomize three groups again, but one group will maintain their previous training volume. They're not going to change it. They're going to keep, they're going to be the positive control. One group is going to maintain the volume. Uh, another group is going to increase by 30 and the third group is going to increase their volume by 60. So pretty much one group kept the volume. Other group, if you're doing like, if you're doing like 20 sets times 1.3, that's now 26 sets. So you're increasing by 3%. And the other group, pretty much, if you're doing 20, 1.6, now you're going to increase 60. You go to 32 sets, for example. That's what we did. So no, we like to say that no experimental unit, like each individual, no one reduced their volume compared to what they're doing previously. I think that was something... I saw we had a design we discussed together. We then I'm gonna try to wrap it up everything and put the things, the points together, connect the points. So that's what we did. But just to see the variation cats between what the people are doing, do you know the range for previous volume? Four sets to 49. <laughs> we have a people yeah. doing four sets only. And, and again, like a, when, when people criticize in social media, like who? Who, who does do like a 20, 40, uh, 40 sets, 45? Yes, some people do that. We had a, a guy doing 48 or 49 and people doing as low as four sets. Then we randomized all those guys across the groups. The average, again, the, on average, the group one, I think was 12, 14. The group that kept the volume, the control, on average, they were doing 12, 14. Again, some people were doing more and some people were doing less but nobody there reduced their volume. The 30% group was very close to 20 on average, but some people doing more or less. And the 60% group, they were on average 25. Again, a little more, a little less because you had the people doing all the way four mm. to 49. I just hope the guy doing the 49 didn't get put in the 60 group. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think, you know what? We talk about that. And I, I really don't recall. I think he ended up in a moderate, whatever. But I, I think he did not end it up in the, the 60, but he ended up on the moderate one or, or the control one, not the 60. I, I need double check. <laughs> so we talk about that. Like, I mean, that guy's gonna, that guy's gonna die here if he gets the 60% increase. So 
Another thing you're doing as well, like the last study, rather than just looking at two sides of material type thickness, we, al we also look at the regional fat-free mass accretion with a DEX. And one thing that we did that in that study from Albe, we implemented the knee extension and that's a, that because the NS paper, and I think you, you were the few people who read the one that's under review, I shared with a very few people. And the exercise selection design is very similar. If you compare, everything is very, very similar. We did that intentionally. Results, here you go again, no differences for muscle hypertrophy regardless. In fact, if you look at effect sizes, a little better for the group that maintained the, their volume for hypertrophy. No differences when you look at local fat-free mass accretion and muscle thickness. For the strength, we had the better results for the control group. I think it was not a surprise. And that was something, if you remember, we did a covariate analysis because they were a little stronger at the beginning. So is that group effect because they were already stronger? And then we did the, covar the covariate analysis. And for reps to failure, that was totally out of the blue, was the 30% group increase. All right, now trying to connect the points with volume in literature. And again, I keep doing this and I have a way more questions than when I started. And to be quite open, every volume study I was involved in, my bias was higher volume is going to be better. That always was my thought. Every study that I was, that always was my thought. So now when you try to connect the dots, I think like hypertrophy, let's, let's focus on hypertrophy. I always like to say that strength is a different beast. We might talk about that in a different podcast, but let's talk about hypertrophy. So something that, again, is another thing we need to advance and see, does a baseline strength impact adaptation? And why I'm making that question? Because all base study, the one RM body mass ratio for the squat was two point something, two oh something, right? They they were able to probably the strongest cohort when you compare all the studies. The set that study under review, the, the one RM body mass ratio again two point oh something. I think it was two ten, if I'm not mistaken. We have uh, the two studies with uh, uh, the strongest cohort or the strongest individuals showing no difference. If you look at and as a study, we might say it's the, the third, the strongest, because they were 1.70 something. And it depends on the check. I, for me, I was more concerned about false positive than, than false negative. And I always, that might be my bias. I always try to be very conserv conservative when we are writing, presenting the, the findings. And as paper, again, the, uh, the post hoc analysis we did with a confidence interval, did, a, did not show any differences between the groups, but if, and again, we can also talk about people, oh, we can't interpret data in the dichotomic way or binary. We can talk about that as well. I'm not, I don't agree too much about that. The decision-making process in applied setting is dichotomic. Should I buy creatine? What is the answer? Very likely, less likely. No, yes or no. Should I implement partials? Very likely, less likely. No, it's yes or, right? I, I think it's still dichotomic when it comes to decision-making process in applied settings. My thought was, okay, when I look at the studies with the strongest individuals, the difference between high, moderate, volume, and even low, they're not that clear. And when I look at Brad Schaffer's study and also Brigato's study, that one IM body mass ratio for the squad for those two studies was 1.3, 1.4. It is like a Jewish stronger people because they put a more tension because they're stronger. They don't benefit too much from high volume compared. I miss you again. I miss you. I, I know it's not sexy at all, but after doing those studies, I have those questions now. Like uh, that because we're doing a very, we are working on the big data retrospective study. It's not going to be a meta analysis. We have a something or a advantage. We have a, data that we don't put in the paper sometimes, like a data that we, that was not part of the study, but now we're going to look back those variables to, to try to understand what explains differences in hypertrophic gains when people are undergoing different 
volume. From a practical standpoint, uh, it, it like we got every time you look at those studies, the good studies that always have the. I agree for you. I always start doing a study in the methods section and usually design any stats. And from then I decide whether or not I'm going to continue reading the paper. But the good, I think, again, the way we present is getting better. And when you look across the groups, regardless low, moderate, high, we see important variation and people getting good results with a high volume and low and moderate and low. So my point now is do strength levels explain the difference across the studies? And if I look at the absolute change, I always think that might be my bias. I think presenting percentage change without absolute change for me is misleading. Because when I look across those studies, like even NS, like within a study, the difference between the high volume and the low was half centimeter. And again, we have all, you probably have all different of clients that don't have a time to do 52 weekly sets. So we need to figure out for who that half centimeter more gain is a meaningful change. So I know it's not that sexy, but that where I standing with the volume literature now, maybe the, the biggest study we are doing, that's going to be my first study as a PI, as a first author in a while, because I reach out to everybody. We had the data. Uh, we have uh, so much cool data here. Let's do some crazy analysis and see what you're going to find and, and try to advance a little more our understanding. I think we're getting better. We had so many studies, right, about VOM in the last three, four years. We, again, we have a death paper under review. We have one paper is VOM with athletes, but again, more towards the strength. And we also have the female version. So at least I'm involved. We have the female version. We have the retrospective volume, athletes and volume and strength. And, and the one that's under review. So I'm involved. And I know other people are working on meta-analysis. I, I think two years from now, we might have even more interesting sites to talk about it. And now it's, again, more conservative. And that's the, the, the broad picture. And it's, yeah, I, I know it's harder for a practice to be a, I always joke students, I have the easiest job. You are in charge to pick the right tool for the right client at the right moment. I just put out the research and the practitioners, they, they're going to do with that somehow. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I would say that when it comes to a strength, a factor, an observation in the field, definitely the more advanced trainees tend to be able to get more out of a single set and we tend to see a greater drop off across sets if you're like a really advanced strong trainee if they take a set to failure it takes significantly more out of them versus an untrained person can almost like repeat sets to failure with like very little drop off and then oh, the yeah. spectrum is in there right so whether that's a combination of just simply being able to recruit more motor units as you become more advanced you know etc there's definitely a real world component to that. And I could definitely see that being something that played out over the course of like where maybe that you would see a, a bigger difference between the really strong and the not so trained in a smaller volume group, but maybe over enough volume, it just kind of washes out. Yeah. That's what, that's something that I've been looking at from a variety of ways is that like how many things, like how many variables just get washed out over volume. Like the, for instance, training to failure versus not training to failure. If you start training harder earlier, does the fatigue just basically get you to the same volume load if you do enough sets? And that's the reason well, I feel like, that's kind of the reason I feel like if there is going to be what, like what we experience in the real world as an inverted U probably has more to do with us simply running into a stage where other things in life are impacting our recovery versus like it was the additional sets because as we keep doing more and more sets, our performance just gets lower and lower and lower. How much fatigue are we getting once we are continuing to add sets? And, and then there's the question of, like, can you just go to infinity? And I'm like, well, it just depends on what you would qualify the end step. Like 
I could do squats on repeat for two minutes, but at a certain point, my body weight is going to be like, that's so it's like, how ridiculous are we going to go to try and find this? But I can only imagine that if I, by the end of this, I'm able to do four body weight squats, like how much fatigue can I really be adding to my system doing four body weight squats, right? So those sets are adding so little fatigue once the performance gets to a certain point that I think that yep. what we experience in the real world in terms of an inner inverted U is we're training hard and then we run into life. And we're, it's like our cup is just a little bit more full uh, when we're training a lot. And so the odds that we're just going to, we're going to, okay, I didn't get as good enough sleep or I got a little sick or I had a little bit more stress, et cetera. So sure, if you're training very, very low volume, you probably have a little bit more tolerance to just outside stress. But if you're training really, really hard, well, then you're more dependent on having that recovery. But it's not, I don't think the train, I don't like it's hard for me to rationalize because of the performance drop off that we would get to a point where doing additional volume would actually cause me to lose muscle outside of like those early stages where you're experiencing way more mechanical damage. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, so to me, it's like that what we experience as the inverted U has to just be where we just run into our overall recovery limitations. That's my hypothesis. Yeah, and, no. Go ahead. No, go ahead. And I was just going to say that then when it, you look at advanced trainees, they just simply have the ability to push their body harder as well, right? If you're a beginner, your training may feel hard, like it may feel difficult to you, but you just don't have the ability to challenge your body that well yet. The more trained you become, kind of, you're pushing the limits at what you can do to your body in a training session. So it just gives you the ability to put more stress on your body. Like a lot of times when it comes to looking at either range of motion or absolute strength and stuff like that. And you're looking at everything from like tendon elasticity and stuff. And I'm like, Hey, when we're looking at peaking performance work, a lot of times we're like trying to almost like we're pushing the threshold before injury occurs, like the highest performance, yeah. especially in like power and speed and range, like all of those things come right before it would become in injurious. Right. And you know, a lot of people don't look at it through that window. They just look at it as, oh, when I, I'm just a bigger, stronger of the beginner me. And I'm like, not really. You're able to like, you're putting yourselves, like it's a different scale in terms of the stress that you're putting on your body when you become a more strong and advanced trainee. Yeah. I, again, I agree. The first study, two studies that, that really stood out that was like, man, training people really handle high effort and, and, and they push themselves to a different level because the first study we did was the, uh, we for training people, the first study that I did here at UT as professor was the, we call our regulated exercise. I wouldn't call that anymore, but we have one group with uh, fixed exercise selection. For example, we had the, the exercise menu was squat, leg press, and the extension like a Monday, Wednesday. Uh, Friday. So they have a 48 hours in between. And the, the other group, the uh, outregulate group, like for that week, if you wanted to do two days squat, one leg press or three days leg press, was totally up to you. And it was the same for like all the models, like the full body. So I remember those guys, one IM body mass ratio for the squat was 1.7 as well. And the amount of volume and progression those guys put in, I was like, whoa, they are training 48 hours in between and they're progressing. And again, I was proud. We always had the good trainers in the lab, the students, the researchers, they also good trainers. And all this study that we did was a cute study, was with a techniques, like a training techniques, a superset, force reps, whatever, pre-exhaustion. So they did a 10 sets to failure was 10 sets was five sets, flat bench, five sets incline around eight, 12, but was to failure, 10 sets to failure. They repeated everything again, 48 hours later. RPE was the same, muscle activation was the same, volume load trained to be higher. And I was like, those guys were doing to failure 48 hours before, and now they're pushing even more. It's like a, every time I look that, uh, yes, so they are able, and, and I think it's like you said, it, it's the thin line between 
injury or overreaching sometimes because they're always pushing themselves to a different level. And quite often the mindset of a training, uh, advanced trainee, my, my bias, they always like when they level off of the plateau, they mindset like I need to train harder or more. It's always, and that's sometimes it's just recovery, switch exercises. We always, but going back to volume, like I think my statement was not that sexy, but I think it's worth it. If you, if your goal is hypertrophy, I think it's worth a shot to have a specialization phase and try to increase and figure out if you, your body and muscles respond better with higher volume. But again, like there is, I keep saying that there is specificity hypertrophy because so many things grow muscle, but there is specificity for hypertrophy, right? Proximity to failure, searching volume, exercise selection seems to be an important factor and progress overload. I always tell be your own lab, figure it out. Like uh, they study, they studies give us the framework. And I try to figure out how your body and muscles respond to different approach. It's worth it to, to give a shot and a try when it comes to higher volume specialization. If a hypertrophy is your goal, I think, yes, I, I would try it. I just think that it's still very debatable uh, whether or not, I don't think everyone would benefit from higher volumes. But uh, yeah, that's my position. Maybe two years from now, it might change. So if we're looking at the studies that are looking at increasing volume from whatever your current like status would be, the ENIS study was the most like moderate progressions, right? Like it was progressive over time and all the other ones, it's been basically like from the start, it's just been a jump in volume, yeah. right? And correct me if I'm wrong, but of those the ENIS study was the only one that showed favorable. So does that kind of like maybe give the inclination that if you were going to try and do more volume, that it should kind of be a, maybe it's more favorable to do a slow progressive approach than say, hey, I'm going to jump into a specialization phase. So I'm just instantly going to double my volume for this body part, but rather, hey, if I want to do a specialization phase, I should still like progressively increase the volume for that body part. I we definitely need more data here, but I, I agree that if it, it makes more sense to, especially the way we did, you have a, because like a percentage wise, when you increase six over 22, that was about almost 25%, something like that. Yeah. Something around this. So it is a big job, but then the last week, the, the, the last two weeks when you increased 52 over 46, right? Mm -hmm. was, was that? Yeah, 46 plus. That was about 12, 13% increase. I, I think it may we definitely need more data because that would, I agree. Like that's something we do with the studies. Uh, they start with one big bump of progression at the beginning. And then we're going to hold that for eight, 12 weeks. I and again, we keep saying about the inverted U, but we still need to figure out when or where that happens when it comes to the, the progression you're using, right? Set numbers, yeah. set Y, it's like when that will take place. And, and I agree that maybe it's just like a common sense. If uh, you jump from 22 to 52, again, I don't know for how long you're going to tolerate that and recovery and, 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 and all the other factors that come out of play. Again, volume wise, we were the first, if I'm not mistaken, to set wise, you're the first to do that. And I think that I agree for you. If you're going to increase volume, you're going to give a try for a specialization phase. I would progress slowly rather than big jumps in volume. Yeah. Now, one, one of the limitations we have in looking at these is we only have a start and an end measurement. We don't know what's happening in between and there's so many possible scenarios that could get you know from the start to the end point and yeah this i actually in my post kind of summarizing the 52 set study that's what i did is hey we don't know were these people on the way down were they on the we way tried. up we would because to know that we would need like incremental measurements and potentially in some of these cases where you're doing a huge volume up front 
what you're actually doing is you're reducing the progress of those initial weeks, but maybe after they've acclimated, after the repeated bout effect had kicked in and their strength endurance and everything had gotten a little bit better, they might actually have been in a place where they were making relatively good progress towards the end of the study, but the net over there. So that's one of the questions I have on these is, is man, without having those data points, like we have no idea, hey, could it, could it, the issue be that it just takes a certain amount of time to acclimate to certain levels of volume and there's going to be some individual variants, et cetera, and stuff in there. So depending on, this was an eight-week study and the NS was 12 weeks, right? Wow. Yeah. So could it be that like, hey, over eight weeks, if we're doing big jumps in volume, that's just not a actually enough time for you to adapt to that volume yeah. if you're increasing it that fast. So that's another lens that I look at this. So that's one of the reasons I lean towards, well, I mean, my, my machinery to do protein synthesis and everything, like I don't just keep extra ribosomes around just because they're good company. Like what, it, like the, the density I have of those, my mitochondria, all that stuff is relative to the current training stresses that I'm doing. So is it even reasonable to expect to double your volume and be able to perform or recover that well? Or would like, if we're looking at the net benefit, would it make sense that, Hey, what I should do is I should try to move more at the pace of what my physiological adaptations to that would be. So that I'm always, every week is a little bit pro of progress instead of hitting yourself with a hammer right away with a huge increase. And then by the time you adapt to that, cool, then you could start making progress. But do you have this week window of two, three, four, six weeks where you would have been making better progress had you used to the more slower yeah. progression? That's where my brain goes when I'm thinking like, what's happening in the middle of we these try, man. Tried for, for that paper, to be honest, like I have a few papers published at, at this point in my life. Only my PhD, I had a 12 weeks and I did a six weeks measurement point with a hypertrophy, MRI hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. And was, what was interesting because that was a periodization study, I, I think to date, the only study looking at no periodized versus periodized models with a uh, uh, gold standard technique. And at the end, everything was very, very similar, but the, the, the periodized groups did better in the second. They literally caught that up like a, the second phase of the study. And again, because we dropped volume as well, the, because it was progressing in more intensity, I think that's another thing, the periodization studies for hypertrophy. It don't matter because you keep changing what's not so important to hypertrophy. For, again, for Alison paper, it goes back to the analogy of a cold blank in the cold night of camping. We need to figure out what you're going to do because intervention wise was 12 weeks plus the acclimatization phase and the two weeks progression was just like a training. Uh, they were trained about 16 weeks plus pre testing, post testing. From logistics standpoint, it's, it's always challenging, but I agree for you, like we, we are missing those uh, uh, midpoints assessments. Definitely would be very, like, I would love to have that assessment for NS paper. We all, uh, speaking by all the authors, we tried, we couldn't, but yeah. Yeah. Well, then the swelling question would be even more of a thing, right? Because you'd always be training or always be measuring close to... Uh, a training. Oh person. yeah. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> so me like, so one of the questions that uh, I had queued up was to look at the volume load data, because maybe I'm just seeing what I want to see or hypothetically mm -hmm. see. So if I'm looking at the volume chart or the volume load chart for the NS paper, and I'm looking at that high volume group, I'm looking at this kind of above below the trend line, like it's doing this. And to me, that's a sign of, but I'm trying to match it up with the the timeline of when things increased. But it, is it a scenario where, hey, you know, we increase the number of sets, right? And then basically it takes a week for us to like really acclimate to that. And then we get a better performance and volume load. And then so we're seeing like kind of this, this kind of undulating thing going through there. And I'm like, okay, well, maybe that's just a signal of this, hey, Novelty adaptation, novelty adaptation, novelty adaptation. That, and that we're seeing that happen in the volume load, just looking at like the, because the, there does seem to be like this undulating 
pattern yeah, but in there. So. Why was on the lady? Keep in mind because you have uh, twenty weeks, so you have a you're looking at you have a twenty four dots there, right? So mm -hmm. it, it's choose uh, passions. Yeah. Yes, well, it's twelve dots because it's by per, week. It, it's by week, right? It's by week. Yes, I believe. I, yeah, the, I don't remember now. It's yeah, twelve. Yeah, or, it's, it's twelve. Yeah, it's twelve. Yeah, if it's twelve, what are you saying? Makes sense because as we had a high and low rep day, that would like they pull you see individual dots. Yeah. So the other uh, study, yeah, that's very apparent that it's the two, it's the two, it's the two. Because the other one, it's plotted by sessions. This one's plotted by week, so it should include the volume from the was, high and the yeah. low rep session. And, and I think it, it it got more steady towards the end as well because, like like I said, is it was I'm gonna say that I, I think the they learn how to pace themselves. Like a day, they kind of were like, uh, oh, now the week we are inc inc incrementing. I'm really going to stick to two in reserve and not going one or shy to failure at all. They they literally, we, we were talking. And, and like I said, like we, we saw, like when you compare the drop between first and last set, that was like, the drop was way bigger at the first half of the study compared to the second. But every week we change it. Every week they progressed. They, they pace themselves in the way like I'm, I'm really going to stick to shy to failure and then go the last one. They, and then they start pushing a little more the, the second week with that. Yeah. So looking at this and the, and the 30, 60% study as well, I guess the adaptation to the density, I guess I found pretty remarkable because initially, like in my mind, what I was expecting is that the volume load would look a little like it would start tapering off, meaning that basically the 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 performance of the sets after a certain amount would just keep degrading mm -hmm. over time. But it seems to be that the adaptation for strength endurance mitigated that from happening versus if we were to just take a bunch of people and acutely run them through a bunch of periods of volume, we would see this drop off where basically everybody once they started getting to a certain percentage volume over what they're used to they would just like like the example we gave with the with milo replicating the study and getting to half the reps for half the load yeah so okay. the two things that stand out to me there is okay so the ability to adapt to that type of density is pretty is pretty substantial but also it points out to me of like how novel the density in these volume studies probably is for the average person compared to the way they do train. And so that's just, okay. That's that the lab effect yeah. we need to account for you. Yeah. I agree. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree that the, probably the type, the, the, the density, if you think about work to rest ratio, the, whatever you call the, the density thing, that definitely was way different from what they were doing for, for sure. And the novelty of that stimulus, that, that because. Studying training people, uh, trust me, man, I put a lot of effort into this because it, it is, it's hard. We don't have a money to do that. Uh, we need to account for so. It, it's a different thing when you bring those guys to the lab. They're ready. They come with uh, their own background and they're very different between the participants. And that because like a, I told you the first part of our conversation, I really want to have an acclimatization phase with the intervention for five, six weeks in the lab. After that, I'm going to randomize them. So mm -hmm. that would be way yeah. stronger, right? And again, every time we, we create, don't like to say, but I like a quick side, but every time you analyze these studies that were, the only thing I'm doing is something interesting now because of the previous studies. And, and, and I'm really, uh, and, and that's why you keep advancing. But at this point, to me, like, a, we got to do better based on the things you said. And I have the same questions in my mind all the time. Like uh, we need to account for those differences in background and for, okay, we're going to do the G loading progression for volume, but density is another factor. There, there are so many factors that come into play that we got to find a way to mitigate them. And maybe my option is not, again, like uh, maybe someone will have a better option because for me, like a, uh, the next study, I'm going to be senior supervising in the lab. I only want to do it if we're going to start with a five weeks acclimatization. Those guys training hard with a similar density they're going to face during the experimental phase. And then you're going to randomize them. 
that's def- that because I don't know when I'm going to start a new one. But that's what I want to do at this point. I, I agree with you. So let me start with kind of my position stand on the volume thing, because I know the scientists, mm-hmm. they hate, you know, we hate to have an actual, a, a strong opinion on anything because the answer is always, well, we need more research and whatnot. So I'm happy to, <laughs> I'm happy to jump in front of the bus and be like, here's what I think right now. But then basically I would like you to let me know if you think I'm getting my head over my toes on where the research is. Because when people are asking the question of is volume, is more volume better, right? The first question is more than how much, right? Because the the question most people have is, am I doing enough? Should I do more? And the way that I look at volume is I look at it through the lens of volume of stimulus, not necessarily volume of sets. So when I'm looking at, so you could say volume load is a closer proxy than set volume, but it's not perfect either because you have different rep ranges, et cetera, or whatnot. But it's really just like trying to, put the overall amount of work you're doing. So, you know, if you're training closer to failure, those sets count more. If they're better exercises, then those sets count more. So I look at it as like, hey, if you're focusing on really good quality exercise, you have really good technique and you're training closer to failure, then you're going to need less total number of sets. And then when we have exercises where maybe, okay, this exercise isn't necessarily quite as good. My technique's not quite as good. I'm training further away from failure. Well, then vault, like hitting the set volume button is the way to equalize that stimulus. So the first thing I try and get people to understand is that push pull ratio of, okay, what I'm trying to do is get a certain amount of stimulus and sets is one way to get it, but also effort is another way to get it. Um, And then understanding the relationship of how rest intervals, et cetera, also affect the magnitude of those sets. Hey, if I'm taking shorter rest intervals, I might do more sets. If I'm recovering a little bit more. I might use fewer sets. And then we also give people a little test to say, hey, if you actually want to see whether or not your rest intervals are really impacting your performance, do a little experiment to see how resting at two minutes versus three minutes affects your volume load in an exercise. And if a lot of people are actually surprised at how will they do on some of the shorter rest intervals, right? And then some people are surprised at how much they benefit from a little bit more rest. And there's a lot of individual variance because it's going to depending on training age, the exercises that you're doing, et cetera. So really when I'm looking at this, it's more of, hey, what levers am I moving up or down? And how is, is that moving the stimulus up or down? And the stimulus is the thing that I'm trying to you know accomplish. Given the variance in the research, is this, what's the, what's the number of sets that you need? And I'm like, like, You'd have to, you would have to standardize all of those other things for then me to give a range and it still wouldn't be a very confident range. So can, am I going to disagree with the standard of, oh, it's somewhere between six and 20 sets is what you need for hypertrophy. And I'm like, given all the other variables, like it's perfectly reasonable for that range to exist because somebody could get, somebody could be doing six extremely hard sets with very good exercises and very good technique and they're really well trained and they're getting, they're just getting everything they can out of those sets. And somebody could be doing 20 sets with short rest intervals and it could be a short muscle length position, et cetera. And it's not that fatiguing and whatever. And they could actually experience less fatigue than the person doing the the six sets. So there's all different. So to me, I try and tell people like, Hey, what we're going for is stimulus, which is a tough thing to get people to wrap their head around because there isn't a single proxy for stimulus. But it's just to understand how these things move up or down, start somewhere, and then basically you have to base, like adjust based off of your experience. Like just pick a starting position and then understand the options you have to move things up or down and then start using those things. But in a progressive fashion, don't just like radically change things. And what I usually try and tell people too is, is if you're still in the kind of like trying to learn about what you're like the average volume you should be approaching is change one thing at a time, right? Don't change exercises and sets and rest all at the same time. So start with simple, progress one or two, one variable here. If that's not working, try another one, et cetera. Or oftentimes it just ends up being progress the variable that's the most practical. Because some people, I can't add more sets because I don't have more time unless I decrease rest. I don't want to rest any less than I have. Well, then your sets need to be harder. It's that simple. The only way to get more out of yeah. time is you just have to work harder 
per, per set, right? And a lot of times from a coach's perspective, that's really what it is, is it's helping your clients find which of these actual levers is going to work best for them with whatever limitations that they have. So I don't know if you think I, we have a more confident range than that, or if we're more certain that more is better or less is not as good, but I like, I'm in the, it, it makes sense that more volume can be better, but then where the cutoff for that is and putting numbers to that is very difficult for me knowing all of the other things. I will say to wrap this up, the hit approach to training, which is basically doing a very low or doing like just one all out set. I think I don't, I'm not going to say it's the best hypertrophy approach by any means, but I do think there is value to most people taking that training approach at some time, because psychologically, when you only have one set, you really learn how to get the most out of a set. So you set the scale of what is possible in one set when you do those approaches. And I just think that for a lot of people learning to be able to actually push a set that hard, then that's going to carry over and benefit you when you're like actually doing higher volume and you're using RER training or whatever you're doing, because now you've set the scale. You actually really know because a lot of people's failure is not that failure. And that's probably why the lab effect is such a, a, a strong factor in there. So I do think that psychologically there is valid. And I also think that people underestimate the efficiency of training that way. And so I know a lot of people who unnecessarily make the decision to not take their training serious for a period of time when they feel like they can't commit a certain amount of time. And then I know some other people that have gotten to the point of, oh, I'm just very good at prioritizing a limited number of things or really focusing on these methods to get a lot out of a set, like a myo reps or a drop set or a rest pause, et cetera. And it's, there are ways to get more out of less time. And I think that's where learning how to push really hard acutely can be very, very valuable because it just teaches you to be efficient, which I think most people should learn how to be efficient before they just try and do a, good, a, a ton of something, right? You should, I think you should be good at doing the thing as an individual. Like you should be good at doing a set before you try and do a bunch of sets that you're not good but, at. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I, man, it's a lot to, to I, I, I really like your approach and, and it is the approach of a, the, a very good coach and practitioner. I, I think you touch on the things to me are really important. And, and again, if you want to pinpoint how you're going to respond, you can't change everything at once and, and then progress slowly. All those things that kind of the, and, and I think, I don't know if I get the vibes, if I don't know if you talk about oh, science versus practice, I, I don't know if that's an issue. I, 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 I don't know. I, I'm not that. Not so often on social media, but sometimes I, I get the tension and I, I agree for you. It's hard to come up with one number when it comes to volume. It is attractive to say more is better, but it's also questionable. It depends on other variables and the interaction of other. If you just talk about manipulating volume, at a certain point, it seems attractive to think more is better. But you start to manipulate effort or other, or other variables, it, it, now it, it gets a little harder to say that mod is better. I definitely agree for you that once in a while, you need to go to failure to learn how to gauge effort when you're doing which ball sets. For a given, so you start a training block, right? For that training, and, and I agree, another thing that I agree that I think volume loads is it, it, important metric for monitoring, because think about that. For that training block, right, that, yeah, I can't do more, can't do more, more sets because time, but if you're going to do that, they're going to decrease rest interval between sets. So you're going to see that for maybe for the first week, there'll be an increasing volume because you're already doing more sets, but you're going to see that the, the intensity now going to drop because you're having rest, less short rest interval. And then everything is going right and you're adapting from that volume the volume load should progress, right, across the time. So I think I, I see that set number is one way to take you there to provide body with stimulus, but there are interactions, li like you said, and the like volume load, because we don't say that, oh, today I'm going to hit 10,000 pounds for squat. We don't know. 
We usually it's set times rep, right? And then you're going to look at the volume load. But I, I think that from practical standpoint, I really like our approach and, and, and I could not agree more about progress slowly, take time to learn your body about from an effort standpoint, from progression and using different variables as well. So one thing once in a while, you'll go to failure to learn what to gauge effort when you're doing multiple sets and different stuff. And try to isolate the things you are changing and then you're going to learn from your own training experience. Again, it, it, it's I like your perspective, but I think it's attractive, I, again, be a little repetitive, it's attractive to say mod is better when you only talk about set and to a certain point, I don't think that there is a, for me, there is a diminution returns after some number of sets. And like maybe for someone, that small difference is important for someone who's going to step on the stage, whatever, from a static standpoint, I'm fine with that. But I think when you're putting out the variables, the example you gave for someone with a six sets with a high level effort, good technique, and someone with a 20 sets, with the things that are not so efficient, that's a perfect example to me. So no, I, I really like our perspective. All right, let's have that be, now that I have you agreeing with me, let's go ahead and make that the stamp on the volume topic. For that was day. about it. You was, you know. yeah. Yep. So goal accomplished. So let's switch over to long muscle lengths and looking at that. So you have had some, we'll say criticisms of maybe the, is it's mostly focused around length and partials than long muscle lengths, if I'm getting that correct yeah we, we, we can talk about both but yeah okay. yeah okay so why don't we start with why don't we start with your thoughts on the meta-analysis regarding length and partials mm -hmm. and then we will expand into length and bias in general okay that's all right and again those criticisms that they, they, they are more about analyzing the data the, the claims you are making based on the data and, and, and those kinds of things, I think that's important to say. It's not, at least to me, it's never personal. Is look at the data the way it is. And I know the meta-analysis, I, I know a few people there. I published with a Brad, for example. And it's always about, and again, we scientists, we disagree. That's a beauty of what we do. So my, my issue for the meta-analysis is, it, it, to me, because... If you compare every, it's the same thing that the volume. When you have a, like studies going different directions, we start to say there is something else here. Like the example, we talk about the baseline strength, the difference in previous volume. Those are the questions. And then when they read papers about lengthening partials or the meta-analysis, I have a question that is not critics towards the authors, but it's like a, we need to advance and things we need to consider here. Because if you look at the studies isolated, it is some studies didn't favor either, like a no difference between partial full range of motion. Some studies favored lengthening partials. And it seems that when you have a more measurement and volume is where few studies favor full range of motion. So again, we have a kind of, we can do the cherry picking, right? I, I can come here and, and say, hey, that study full range of full, full wrong was better, or I want to say just lengthening partials is better. I, I, I can pick the studies and say either way. So the meta-analysis to me is I received, I, I, I was funny because I didn't read the meta-analysis and then someone like, hey, have you heard about the meta-analysis that people are saying that lengthening partials are better for hypertrophy? And until that point, I didn't read the meta-analysis and when someone says A is better than B for hypertrophy, he gets my eyeball because for hypertrophy, it's really hard to say A is, is different from B for, for hypertrophy. It's like, a, and then I, I read the meta-analysis like, okay, most important thing was that if you consider the Cassiano, the Italo, they did a systematic review. And I, I don't remember the reason, but I think they decided not to go to a meta-analysis because that after systematic review, we may or may not go to a meta-analysis. And they stopped it there without a meta. And then like for me, we only have a seven or eight studies. They said they include eight. Again, that's not a big deal. We can always download the, the material because they pre-rest or whatever. 
They said they include seven papers, eight papers on meta-analysis, but I only, I could only, I only found like a seven. That's fine. And those papers are, like I said, out over the place, not going to one direction, favor one versus another. So it was a divided my opinion. And that's why they stand at this point, because I think it might be, we're going to advance a conversation. It might be exercise specific. It might be muscle specific. People are, are, are using their chamberly range of motion with a muscle length in the same way. We, we can get the, to, to those things. But a meta-analysis is like a, the, the right interpretation. When you look at, when they have the subgroup analysis, they have a moderator to see the, 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 the muscle length. And something I think we can all agree, quite often full range of motion and lengthening partials are better than short, short bias, right? We, we can say that short bias when you compare short versus lengthening partials or short versus full range of motion, the full range of motion lengthening partials, usually they do better. So that did not surprise me. But then like when that, when that look, uh, comparison between lengthening and full, they only have 40 studies, including the moderate analysis. Again, th that limits big time the certainty to, to make claims about an effect. And I did that when I read the discussion, I was quite surprised that, oh, I, I don't agree with that shape because your analysis, the right interpretation to me is that when, based on the papers you included, we cannot say that lengthening partials uh, generates more hypertrophy than full range of motion based on that and that. And I sent the graph, I sent the, I sent the graph for a few friends of mine who are researcher and uh, questions that I got, because do you think you have a fact here? And quite often, like, a, no difference, right? Yeah, no difference. And other few people like, a, oh, we have one observation here favoring the one, one because I, I hidden the groups. So I just sent the graph and like, oh, but we have one observation here that six times the overall effect. Because again, the overall effect was trivial and was not different from a statistical standpoint. And then people are going to say, yeah, but you can't interpret research in the such binary way. And now it's like a, yes, we can always, I, I partially agree. We can always account for different things, but confidence intervals is, is one metric you usually we like at most to compare differences between groups. And what we saw that is the new point of estimate, the zero was in that comparison saying that if the effect, the, the, the effect here might be zero, the difference, the effect that we might observe between lengthening and full range of motion based on that graph and that analysis can be zero, nothing. And my criticism is that that meta-analysis, in my opinion, not saying I'm right, they are wrong, vice versa. Well, I'm just saying that based on what I understand from data, that meta-analysis does not support that lengthening partials generates more hypertrophy than full range of motion. I think that's like a, my, based on that meta-analysis. And I know you had the two papers after that, talk about them as well, but I tried to summarize mm -hmm. all the meta-analysis and not to make that complicated, but that's my position about the meta-analysis, my issue. I'm not even going to attempt to say one way or another, because that's a deeper statistical analysis than I have done or could do probably yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, on, on that paper. But I, the first question I have is, do you said we have the researchers all over the place. Can you give me an example of a study where full range of motion did actually outperform a lengthened partial? Oh man. Because I don't recall one yet. I know we've had the, I believe maybe it was the Warnicke study that was the leg press study that showed no difference. Let me see it. But I can Because cannot... again, I always don't, I never remember the name of this, I think. Okay. I cannot think of a study yet that has showed full range of motion outperforming length and partials. That's not me uh, saying that effect, I don't effect think. Effect of range of motion in heavy load squatting or muscle and tendon adaptations. Brown Quisty, they compare deep squats zero to 120, and they compare shallow squats. And the results here, they did a 10 slices. And uh, for that study, uh, it favored 
the, the full range of motion. So they compared shallow zero to 60. And, but again, that was all lengthening, right? Zero to six, you talk about. Yeah, that would be a short partial, right? Short partial, yes. Yeah. 20. Yeah. There's so, plenty of examples, I think, where full range of motion be a short partial. I know that that's true. Yeah. I so, cannot think of an example where one has, where a full range of motion study has beaten a lengthened partial. Yeah. So if that exists, I'm missing it. Yeah. And then you have a Dutch study now, like uh, the, Balamatus, but that was, again, was no differences, right? So the influence of full range of motion versus equalized partial, that was knee flexion, the extension zero to six. Yeah, maybe. Okay. Let me see it. Yeah. Go to paper is the one that, again, probably is the one with the inflated effect size because mm -hmm. go to that paper. I, again, I think that we still deal with a systematic arrow because they use muscle thickness to predict uh, muscle volume. And I like uh, training people increase. I, I know triceps usually grow more compared to lower body. Some people reach out with uh, the last mile we study, talk about, hey, don't you think that's too much? Like uh, for triceps, I'm fine with uh, that change. But again, for go to paper was 50%. That was. And the go to Google paper. paper also was no G press, right? Yes. So. There was um, no difference yeah. between the full range and the or shortened or, 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 partial, yeah. right? And in the go to paper, the partial is a mid range and they don't have enough information in the, in the methods. But if we go by like traditional biomechanical standards of say a maximum 130 degrees of elbow flexion, then basically the partial I think was like two degrees longer on average muscle length. So I don't think that is a good study in this question anyway, considering that the average muscle length is almost identical. And then yeah. the measurement errors and the result be, being such an outlier. So I don't, but I would definitely would not say that that's an example of a full, like, so the partial group actually got more. But it was no, in the, the same the average. Paper, partial, but more, yeah. More, yep. It, but it was at the same average muscle length as the full range. So I don't know that it, that's a good one for this question, right? Considering that the meta analysis was based off of but average I think, muscle I think length, they not absolute. A paper there. No. I can't find a paper they included, but I think they included. And again, not accusing me, okay? Anyone like is because that effect size, that huge effect size, to me, oh, it might be go to paper. So, because it's six times bigger than the overall effect. Again, and when you see C partial, it also seems to be more distal thing as well. And I know the setup of exercises also are helping with that results. I, again, not a, saying there's a confirmation bias, but it seems to have a better distal effect. The studies that I remember, but if you're more familiar, you, you feel free to jump in, but I, I have a, we can talk more about it. Yeah. So if I'm summarizing the research on length and partials, and so we have a lot of length and partial versus short partial stuff, like we have the, the preacher curl, we have, I think two studies now comparing a length and short and partial with the length and partial being better. That doesn't answer the question versus the full range of motion. Maybe, and there's okay. a couple. Let's talk about oh. those three studies, right? So okay. if we ask for any practical issue, like you're doing preacher curl, zero to 65. And then 65 to 130. Mm -hmm. Do you have any doubt that distal partial would respond better? Well, if you're not adjusting the load to what, but I think, yeah, instinctively, most people are going to be like, oh yeah, the bottom is where I feel it more and there's more stretch, et cetera. Right. But also most people have no idea what the experience is like to do a true like eight rep max with a load that they could do in the top half of that exercise. So mm -hmm. I think, I don't know that this is a fair question because I don't think most people could even, I could even perceive the context of what it would be like, because you'd have to use like 
yeah. almost twice but, the dumbbell size to do the top parcel yeah, but as you would. I agree about the people that most people can't understand that, but not driving too much, not diving too much in biomechanics. If you think about force length relationship, internal, external momentum arm, the partial, the part, the part of exercise that's going to feel harder. I think that, and you have a small flexion in the elbow, in, in, in the shoulder. So it does not surprise to me that lengthening partials in bridge curve exercise, you do better distal partial compared to short length bias. I don't know, like that's very expected result to me. Yeah, I agree that it's the, that that is the expected result. I guess my question is how, just because it's ex expected, does that mean that isn't good evidence towards length and partials being beneficial? You set one condition to fail and, uh, and yeah. then you're going to say another one is better. And, and again, I think there is something about length and partials. So I should say that I think it can be a two in a box. I, I, my concerns at this point are with uh, extrapolations. We have a very limited studies, very limited muscle groups, mostly untrained people. And you are making recommendation across the board exercises, population, so on and so forth. I think for those exercises that the hardest part, I'm going to say that the hardest part of exercise is at the lengthening partial. I think for those exercises, like a, the, the, the essential part where it is the hardest, I think we may have a benefit there. And again, like it goes back 40 years ago, classic papers from Hortobaji comparing eccentric and concentric. There is something that stretching muscle under load, there is something there. I, I'm not denying that. I'm, I'm just like, I would be more cautious with extrapolation. That it, it, it is, it's, and the type of design that's when you set one condition to fail, is saying that uh, my take, yes, when you compare preach lengthening with a partial, is saying that lengthening, the lengthening condition increase muscle size, but the short, again, same result with a staging curve. Would you see the same result? Maybe yes, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, but I think that I don't see the preacher, the limitation there for the preacher curl being any different than looking at the squat and comparing a, a partial at the top, a short partial compared to a full range of motion. If we're comparing part, if we're comparing parts of the range of motion, the most challenging portion can't exist in both partials. It's going to have to be in, in one or the other. And that most challenging position is also relative to a load that you could move through the full range of motion. So when we start, if I do take the, the top partial for the preacher curl, the most challenging portion of that partial is the bottom of it with the, with the heavy load. So I, I don't know. I'm, I see that if we were just, if we were to just look at this under the same loading conditions, yeah, that's absolutely a limitation. Do I think that the results are as expected? Well, I think every proposed mechanism that we think may be in play for long muscle length training, yes, it favors that the length and position should work. But I don't think that makes this, I don't think that the short position was necessarily was set up to failure unless we underloaded it. Otherwise, I think it's a valid, this, it, we're going to, every single think, joint that's going to be. You think the way the setup. Do you think the bicep was experiencing the same intention at a short position compared to the lengthening position? If they standardized the load? Yeah. Load was the same. So the tension exerted by the muscle, do you think it's going to be the same the, for the short? If the load was, if the load was the same, no, it would be less in the short position because the external moment arm is smaller and the internal moment arm is greater, but they increased the load for the, 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 the loads were both the. They were, I believe it, they were an 8RM or something. I know they, they increased the external load, but do you, do you still thinking that would generate more internal passive tension, active tension? I, again, those. In terms of passive tension? No, because I think passive tension is always going to be greater to longer muscle length. So if, if we're the looking maximal at. Tension, if I'm not mistaken, the maximal tension a muscle can produce is the summation of active and passive components, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's because I think that's. Again, what are we talking about when you are going to discussions between lengthening and short? And again, it might be exercise specific and the characteristics of exercise that put one condition in the way that tension, and you like to assume that mechanical tension 
we can, again, I think at the time we, we believe if there was something about length and partial from a mechanistic standpoint was damaged, I think you are way past to this point. But maybe now is the tension and more specifically the passive tension and something related to tight and so on and so forth. But again, I think some setups for exercise, even though the external load is higher, that muscle is still in not a biomechanical position or at advantage to produce too much tension compared to a lengthening position. And that goes back to my point that it might be exercise specific. It, well, it, it's... The elbow flexors all have pretty poor internal levers at a fully extended elbow, and they have much better leverages in the top or the short range of elbow flexion. So I don't know that I would say that the top position is poorly they don't say it's poor from a biomechanics perspective. Now, from a sarcomere length tension relationship, you could argue, and oftentimes in the body, what we see is an inverse relationship between biomechanics and the, the sarcomere length tension so that there's like this complementary one, the strength of one or the strength relationship of one is complementary the other so that we don't have too many movements where we're really strong at one point and super, super weak at another. So that tends to be like in same thing with muscle architecture, we tend to see that, oh, we see a greater degrees of penation and stuff where it seems to make sense for what a muscle's external levers are versus internal levers, et cetera, in terms of, and then we see what the real life strength curve of those motions is like, oh, okay, then that seems to make sense. And that's also flexible. There was a study that looked comparing male, male untrained, female, and then male bodybuilders. And then they looked at the strength curve for elbow flexion, right? And there was a trend from female to male to then to bodybuilder showing like basically the strength curve kind of changes with size and strength of the muscle and actually becoming more peaked towards the short position as the muscle got larger. I think, yeah, we're just going to have to accept that those are always going to be variables. Like not everybody's strength yeah. curve is going to be the same in a given movement, but it's never going to change like so drastically where it's the curves are going to be similar and they'll shift a little bit or they'll peak a little higher or lower, but somebody's not going to go from, oh, I was really strong in the short and really weak in the length end. And then I trained for a couple of years and it completely flipped. Like we can only change so much because we can't change the internal levers. We're just the length tension relationship that muscle architecture can change a little bit. Yeah. And another thing about those studies, the pitch, there is also a old study from a good friend of mine, like 2012, whatever. But I think they only look at one measurement site and they didn't find difference between partial, but they have a, I don't recall if they compare lengthening partial to short or if they compare lengthening partials to full range of motion. Because those pitch curves, as far as I remember, the comparison are usually short versus lengthening partials, correct? So there's two other studies. One of them is probably the one you're thinking of. One compared a mid-range partial to a full range. And then there's another study that compared a free weight versus a cable variation, right? In both of those, the results, I believe, did not reach significance, but they favored the more lengthened bias variation. So the free weight was slightly favored over the cable for the same range of motion, but different mm -hmm. resistance profile. And again, they only measured one muscle point. And I believe in that study, they may have measured just elbow flexors, not biceps. I can't remember, but one, one of the two studies yeah, no. measured biceps and the other one just measured, like it was a combination of brachialis and the mm -hmm. biceps, I believe. And, and then the study that compared the mid-range partial to the full range of motion, non-significance, but the results did slightly favor the full range of motion version, right? So. It's good. No, I, again, like I'm not, I always say that there is something about stretching the muscle with attention from eccentric, from stretch mediated uh, hypertrophy. My, my concern is, is the extrapol extrapolations you are doing with this topic. That's my concerns. Again, from meta-analysis standpoint, that meta-analysis does not support such a claim, in my opinion, and other people that do research as I do. They look at even authors in that paper. Did they say that the, the, the same? Again, they wrote the paper, right? Yep. But most of studies, 
if I'm not mistaken, we talk about untrained people. And yeah, muscle is the same. I think the should respond the same way if you look at trained people, but the magnitude probably going to be way different. And then you go back to, so the, it's still better, but it's now is way different from my study. It's way different from Pedroza's study yeah. and, and, and so on. We just looking out also like a, just one exercise, not a full workout. I, again, if, because we always talk about exclusion, if you're not talking about exclusion, if, again, it might be my bias because if you talk about the same exercise, full wrong versus only the lengthening partial and the exposure to the lengthening partial is the same, I, I, I don't see why it would be different. Um, it, it, the same exercise, right? If mm -hmm. the same exercise, one, I, again, we're going to focus on lengthening partial. The other one, you're going to do full range of motion. The exposure to the lengthening partial is the same between conditions. I don't see why it would be different. And, and I, I see why the benefit for lengthening partial or even like a, going back to Italy study, the CAVS study, they... If they, they did the volume load progression, and if you, again, the short, they have a three point, they have a short, they have a lengthening, and they have a, the full range of motion for calves. And again, was in training women, the difference, the absolute difference within study, we must talk about absolute difference was 0.12 centimeters. But I, again, I'm going to, I'm going to still give the, the benefit of the doubt is still worth it. But what caught my attention when I look at the paper, that progression for short and short and lengthy was way better compared to full. And then if you put the pink together, connect to Pedroza that found that the varied group was not different from the, the lengthy partial, doing lengthening such conditions might allow people to progress more as well. So I, again, I, I'm still having more questions, but I, I it is that extrapolations to me are, are, are concerned at this point. Yeah. So I, I'm taking the hard stand uh, in, in opposition for the sake of the, of the discussion here, just putting that out there for everybody. I'm not like length and partials are the best thing in the world, but I'm purposely taking the, the opposition point here. So I think, it, right? yeah, I'm, I'm trying to turn you green. If I'm looking, if, if we just remove the, not looking at whether or not the meta-analysis is valid or not, and I'm just looking at my own perspective of the research, do I think that it mostly pretty much being in untrained subjects is a limitation? Absolutely. And potentially it's not necessarily untrained versus trained, but just whether or not the range of motion is novel, period. Because you could be trained, but you don't train at very long muscle lengths, and then you incorporate them. And you get that. That'll so be, I get, go ahead. Just adding, that's another thing, right? If you're going to do lengthy partial studies with the trained people, we need to account for the novelty. What they were doing before they study, right? I, I agree for you, but go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. But so when I'm looking at the research as a whole, I have not found, or the, I don't see any point in the evidence where a full range of motion has outperformed a length and partial. I believe that I believe those scenarios exist for hypertrophy. I believe those scenarios exist, but a lot of what we have in terms of studies is a very similar type of exercise. It's single joint things and it's exercises where there is still going to be a fatigue component in the short position. The one exercise that, or the one study I know that showed no difference would be a leg press. And at the top of a leg press, you basically get to rest. Right. So I, th it, I think that one of the potential benefits of length and partials is simply just that you're going to end up increasing the amount of exposure you're getting in the length and position from a volume load perspective, if you're removing fatigue from a short position. And so if we look at the research as a whole, we have leg extensions, right? Okay, cool. We have bicep curls. We have calves, all of the, we have partial range of motion versus full range but of motion. Correct, correct, correct. Uh, or, besides calves, all those muscles that lengthy partial did better was distal portion, right? So, 
Most believe, of them. Yeah, yep, most believe, of them. Yep, yep. Yeah. And as well as just the overall volume too. Because even in like the tricep studies where I think it was like the, the maybe the Stasanaki study, the, the short position was better in the short bias or the, the proximal was better in the, the short bias, but the overall increase was still favored to the long muscle length, right? But there was actually a larger difference in the proximal site than the lengthened site, but the lengthened site when they did it was a simply a larger muscle mass. So for overall cross-sectional area, it still favored the lengthened scenario, uh, which that's getting into the next subject, which is going to be very right. But so right now, I think that if you're just basing off the evidence that we have, and that this is one of my critiques of the critiques, is that I believe that basically everything that supports full range of motion also seems to support a length and biased, right? But all the things that support length or the full range of motion are being compared to shortened partials. And when we have length and partials, we have one instance where there was no difference and all of the other ones seem to actually favor the length and partials. So I think if we're just, if we're, I'm not saying that's how it's going to work when we have more things, but I think the current body of literature is more in favor of for sure a long muscle length bias than full range of motion. And then if we take in the, the Pedrosa study and we look at the quads and the interesting thing for me was, is that basically the full range of motion group only outperformed the short partial. The varied group did significantly better than the full range of motion. Yeah. No, including, the including for strength, right? So it was better than the full range of motion for strength. And the one, like the one hesitation I think a lot of people have with doing a length and partial is even if it was better for perch feet is, oh, but it might not give you strength through the full range of motion. And we talk about single joint, very specific movement. I, I would not, you get stronger the exercise you are doing. I, I, I would be careful in my approach. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know you're going. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so I think, I think there might be the potential from both the hypertrophy and a strength perspective of if we're doing an exercise that's challenging through the full range of motion, that basically limits, we, we, we accumulate fatigue through the entire rep. Right. And so when we look at what the failure point of that exercise, it's dependent on the accumulative fatigue of each rep and we're just getting more. So potentially by breaking up movements into smaller pieces, we might be able to just increase the exposure that we're able to get at that range of motion, which means maybe we can, we, we, we can get to a greater degree of fatigue or stimulus in certain fibers that we otherwise wouldn't get to if our failure point was dependent on the full range of motion. And I think this is probably one of the reasons that mixed training does seem to always be favored over limited training is, is that the small changes in either the movement of the exercise or the range of motion of the exercise slightly influence which regions of the muscle are actually getting a little bit closer to failure and a little bit more stimulus relative to the others, which if you want to make the argument, it was like, Hey, I'm only doing one exercise today and it's all I have to me. It's okay. Would you want that to be a full range of motion exercise and maybe it to be relatively challenging through the majority of the range of motion you could make like in a vacuum, I can see how that approach might be there. And like my biomechanics background, like one of the first places I went to, they're talking about a lot about the physics and the strength curve. They're all about constant yeah. tension and filling that in. And my honest experience is actually trying to make every exercise constant tension was worse for people's hypertrophy results versus using, hey, this exercise is harder in the length end and this exercise is harder in the short and using those in combination, either in a workout or over periodization, et cetera that trying to get, trying to make one exercise do everything, I found I got significantly worse results with myself and clients over that period of time versus separating it out and having, hey, this exercise focuses on the length and this one focuses on the short and then obviously spreading around through divisions and stuff as well. 
So I look at that Perdosa study, and, hey, maybe that's what we're seeing in there a little bit is here's another example of, hey, you know, breaking up that range of motion so that I can get a little bit closer to the limiter being these fibers and then these fibers and the other one might be somewhat beneficial over what I do from a full range of motion uh, perspective. I'm, yeah, I see you shaking your head, so I'm going to let you cut me off here. And no, no, I, I, I will let you... You have a perfect rationale for a study with a mixed range of motion and strength gains, which totally makes sense, but it, it is for me. And again, like we, we come from different biases. For me, it's always, that makes sense, but would that take in place in the actual study for much, uh, compound the movement and, and someone who wants to increase that lift strength? Because, and again, like what's. The council gates, the council gates periodization, which I'm big fan is the one that there is no data at all, propones the change in range of motion, right? Besides load, it's change of range of motion, grip. And I like that approach. I publish papers that support that approach, but the, the extrapolation for one movement to others, it, again, you're not saying wrong, it makes sense. But until you don't have a data, I would say, again, we have a data, Hands down, I'm fine. And, and I'm going to play the devil advocate now in the other way, because if attention is the primary driver of the signal to, to grow, I think you can agree that, right? Mechanical tension should, must be. I don't see why full range of motion would be better than lengthening partial, because again, that the muscle sense tension and the amount of tension coming is the muscle is sensing is pretty much the same. I don't think, and again, it goes back to the passive, the active components. So I also don't, I don't see, a, I, I don't have a strong rationale that why a same exercise again, why full roll would be better than lengthening partial? Because again, the exposure to the great extension would be the same and that's gonna trigger the same, that's supposed to trigger the same signal to protein synthesis, so on and so forth. I, I also don't see the other way around. Why full range of motion should be better than lengthening partials if you talk about a muscle that the hardest part, the greatest tension comes from the lengthening part. So I so the other way, like is I, I can't again. I, I do believe there is something about lengthening partials. It is just like a, we are limited to few studies, few muscle groups, most untrained individuals. And, and I agree for you, if I'm going to pick one exercise, I'm going to pick the exercise with his Anthony bias exercise only rather than I, I would do that. I, I would do the same thing as well. And, but even my own studies, I, I think that we, what we can agree without hesitation that training muscles, and that's something I think we all, I hope you agree, training muscles at the longer lengths enhances hypertrophy, mm -hmm. right? So they yeah. studied my own, we, we can say that. But when they look at the confidence interval, the analysis, yeah, there is a lot of overlapping here. They touch, because people don't read the, the even my own study, the triceps, or they, they touch on the overlapping between confidence interval analysis. There is something. Uh, but I, 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 again, my problem is when you start to, oh, that's the most scientific uh, technique that is backed by science. And you're doing a, a exercise, there, there is no data there. That's my mind that as a, or you're using a meta-analysis. To me, the results do not support such a claim. That, that's why I, I'm not being reactive against lengthening partial is I definitely agree. I, I think when you read the post, I touched on that post that it, it might be a two in the box. I, I, I put it there. You can go back in the post that I, I was pointed out the, the problem for the meta-analysis and I say that again, uh, I believe it can be a tool in a box, uh, for the things we, we talk about here. I'm just like, a, so many things, they make sense from a physiological, uh, standpoint from a logic standpoint, but when you're going to test those things out, uh, they don't work in the same way we expected. So I think like for. Uh, population we have for the exercises we have, I'm fine with saying lengthening partial is at least equivalent. 
then mm-hmm. the, or, or there is no reason to say full raw would be better than, than lamp. I, I'm fine for that statement. But again, the studies need we need to advance in this area with control for the lengthening exposure, controlling for the novelty, putting the more realistic workout and studying other populations. And we can advance the field. That's I'm not that reactive, I, I guess, yeah. in the me part. So that's the extrapolations that yeah. concerns me. Well, I I agree there. And I think that's, uh, that's now a good point to get in. So now I'll take off my devil's advocate <laughs> hat and I will just give you the cast take here, right? <laughs> Which is when we look when, when we look at the potential mechanisms of why length and bias training might be better. One is there may be we may be able to get a greater amount of mechanical tension stimulus because of the passive elements contributing either because we're at the longer muscle length or because we are during the eccentric that the challenge is either staying or increasing, right? And that's not partial related. That would be a length and biased related thing. And so when I look at the research, it's okay. In the limited context that we have, length and partials seem to be favored, but I think that's a very limited lens. And I actually think that length and biased exercises are a better option than length than just pursuing length and partials. And I sent you like the volume load chart that we've got the comparison between exercises that we've done. So you take an exercise like a cable pull down that's like hard in the short position, easy up here. So if you're doing that full range of motion and you stop, right, you might be missing on potentially like another 50, 60 percent of volume load if you were to do like length and partials only or for the same amount of repetitions, you might be able to do like significantly more resistance. So part of length and partials where the benefit may exist is by basically removing the limiter from being the short position, especially in an exercise that's more challenging more, right? there, right? It's going to allow you to get a greater overall volume load in the exercise, especially in the length. And so could it be that it's just simply more volume or could it be that it's not just more volume, but it's more volume and potentially a slightly advantageous range of motion with the extra passive elements. I think it's probably a combination of those two, but I think if it's either one, we still see the results. That being said, I think that when you compare an exercise that is already fairly length and challenged, then the benefit of these partials will wane down to be basically insignificant. Or potentially in some instances, you will actually see the volume load shift the other direction. And that usually happens in exercises where by doing the full range of motion, you almost get like a an intraset rest or some stacking or it removes a breathing limitation, et cetera. So for example, when we've had people try and do this on leg presses, right? If you're doing heavy leg presses in the bottom only, it's very hard to breathe. And so if Gary too, right? right, Yeah. Yep. And so there are admittedly a few people's data that I just haven't included just because of how uncomfortable they are actually Uh trying to do that. Right. But almost across the board, everybody loses repetitions or loses volume load Mm -hmm. doing that. Same thing for bottom of the squat, bottom of the RDL. Now, some people have been like, oh, I get the same or better at the bottom of an RDL versus versus doing a full range of motion. And I'm like, if you can do that, that's fine. I don't know why it is that you can do that. I don't know. Maybe you can breathe through your leg skin and I can't. So I like that might be like, so there's going to be some technique things. And that's another thing that we've observed is people that are more advanced and can actually take a set to failure like to good fatigue, will experience a slightly less of a difference. Because I think there's a certain element of using some of these methods where we might just do partials at the end or something, where people that normally would stop a set, it's supposed to be to failure, but really it's two or three RIR. Well, then when they go to the partials, the amount of partials they can do ends up being inflated. So is there a potential that you could use lengthened partials, not necessarily even if they were outright better, but just as a way of, hey, if this person is normally going to stop here, I'm just extending the set a little bit further because I know that, oh, even if it's psychological for them, like, oh, I can do a few more reps with that. That could be one more way to get somebody to push harder. So we've seen that element. But the trend seems to be that there is the biggest volume difference for length and partials 
in exercises where there's a significant fatigue component in the short position. As an exercise becomes more inherently lengthened bias, the ability to extend a set of partials or the difference between partials only and the regular, basically that gap closes and for some people actually flips the other way around and they actually get more volume out of doing full repetitions. And then when we get into fatigue limitations, et cetera, from respiration and stuff like that, then it definitely seems to switch. So the current body of literature that we have all basically is exercises where there's a fatigue element in that short position with the one exception being the leg press, which showed no difference. So my position on length and partials is, look, if you have a better exercise, you should choose the better exercise rather than just choosing a to do length and partials of an exercise where partials make a big difference. So I think that basically the more that partials make a difference in an exercise shows you how limited the exercise is in terms of length and bias. So basically the best exercises you can do the least partials on. That's if, if we're talking length and bias. So, so that's where I sit on the partials thing. And then when it comes to just length and bias as whole, I think the research becomes stronger because also we just have so many more studies, right? So we have the lying leg curl versus the seated leg curl. And we see that the bias and hypertrophy matches up perfectly with the muscle length. So basically the muscles that are trained at longer lengths in this seated leg curl got better. And the muscles that are trained at longer lengths in the lying leg curl, like the sartorius. So basically, right, right. And we also, and we see that the muscles that really don't experience a change got basically no change, which is going to be like the gracilis and the short head of the uh, biceps femoris. Like, go ahead. If you're going to do two sessions a week based on that study. And again, I agree for you, despite the studies, mostly untrained people. But if you're going to do two exercises for based on the Maui study, right? And you look at the charts between exercises, you do for the two sessions, would you use only seated or you would put a one day seated the other day would be the prone one? Mm -hmm. Well, then here's the other. Data. Here's the other question, right? Is, is that the hamstrings have two functions. The question that we don't know is if you did an RDL, which is training the, which is training those same hamstrings at long length, and then you did the I lying agree. leg curl for the short length, are you basically, you're getting long and short and training both functions? So to me, that's the question. So really what I would say is, should you do, the question would be, what is more important? Do you want to grow your hamstrings more? Or is the sartorius also important? And if you're and and the other thing is, is what machines do you have? Because I think this is why I really want to know the resistance challenge of the machines. Because say you're at a gym and you have a lying leg curl, but it's got a really good cam, so it's actually hard in the bottom and it drops off. And then say you have a seated leg curl and it's got an awful resistance profile. Would that resistance profile then actually change the effect? Because that's what we see in the preacher curl versus the incline curl is with the preacher curl, yes, it's at a shorter muscle length, but where it's actually hard, it is at a longer muscle length, right? Relative I, to the I, incline curl. I, I agree. I just think we need to use the same calcium when you talk, regardless of the side you're going. You see how he's yeah. talking. To extrapolate, I, I played a that where I devocate mm -hmm. once more. Uh, mm -hmm. I, because like you said, there's so many machines. we. Other variables, I just think that, yes, it, it depends on the context, the goal, and I, I see some bold extrapolations when it comes to, mm -hmm. to left and partials. But, uh, yep, I agree with you. Yeah. So I think overall that in an apples to apples comparison, so basically if we're looking at comparing the same exercise or very similar exercises, like an incline curl and a preacher curl. They're both just isolated elbow flexion. There's a stability difference that definitely needs to be accounted for. So that's definitely a confounder in there as well. But like, those are like, okay, very similar. Whereas when we're comparing the squat to the hip thrust, okay, now these exercises are very different. So when we're looking at comparing the same or similar, I think that there's a pretty clear trend towards the lengthened bias. The more lengthened bias is favored. Just, just so whether it be partials or just exercise selection. But then once we get into what happens if we start mixing it up and having some long and some short, 
is that better than just doing long? And I think this is the important part of the conversation that people don't get bought in on that. If you were limited to one exercise, I think you, I think the safe bet would be choose the more lengthened biased one. But should you then only right. do lengthened exercises? I think that's now, I think that's now taking it too far because I also think then the research that we have on mixed training seems to favor actually training mix seems to be better. Meaning that because potentially there's a volume threshold of like, training at this length and stuff where then all of a sudden, if you start training a different range of motion, your potential there is greater than whatever you have left at the length and whether it's because it's slightly regionally different or recruiting a little bit different motor units, et cetera, different region within the muscle or different heads, et cetera, because I don't think, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, cause you no, like, I, you I, were actually I, I, agree. On a couple of these. I, based on the current body of literature, again, it makes sense. But for me, those studies is still dealing with important limitation. We need another point. I forgot, again, if you look at the quality of the studies included in the meta-analysis, nothing to do with the researchers. It's very low quality because, again, if the same exercise are being compared, full range of motion versus lengthening partial, and the exposure to the lengthening portion was the same, I don't see a reason why one would be different than another. And the studies, they fail big, big time reporting when they're comparing full versus lengthening partials, the exposure lengthening portion was the same or not. The studies don't say that. So I agree for you based on the current body of literature, but I can't disregard the low quality of the studies and the poor reporting that does, doesn't let, they don't let me to advance my, my understanding of this topic is it, that extra uh, lengthening partial effect or just because people doing lengthening partial, they spend more time with a greater tension and that triggered more protein synthesis and hypertrophy. So that's, again, it is, it, I, from reading the paper and talk about communicated research or I, I, I your Jake's not wrong, but once more, if a full rate, same exercise, full range of motion and lengthening partials are being compared, I need to know if the lengthening partial exposure was the same. Yeah. And, so and you, you mean like the volume load? Not just the volume load, did like a time and detention for that portion was the same. That's yeah. something important. Because I agree for you that maybe the benefit with length, because Cassiano paper shows that, that like I said, the lengthening partial progressed more volume than full range of motion. And sometimes you are removing the limiting factor and people can progress more. And then it's a combination of more volume per se, or also you stay more time at the portion that the muscle senses more tension. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that is, is, is still doing pretty bad. And like the same thing with a volume, like a, I, I think we have a, decent body of studies to advance the field and try to do the next step now, matching for lengthening exposure, time and, the time and the tension at the lengthening part. Was that, there is no study that state that. And that, that's my scient scientist mind at this point. Again, yeah. I'm not denying the evidence, but I, I need to, to acknowledge where we need to do better. <laughs> so let me, let me phrase it this way. Could you, can you make the argument, an evidence-based argument that full ROM is better? No. Yeah. Right. I mean, I don't think anybody should be extremely strong, I guess, for no. hypertrophy or extrapolating like a tremendous amount. But at the, like the, what people want to know is, okay, today, like based off of what we know right now, I'm playing the odds and I have to make a decision. Am I going to choose this or am I going to choose that? And that's, that's kind of where we are. Right. And I think that we need to be cautious with what we're saying. And that's where I'm like, okay, yeah, it seems to be this, but I'm going to take in the nuance of the exercise selection and look at, okay, within this exercise, how is partials actually going to impact like the amount of volume and where that tension is placed compared to these other things, just like I would compare any two exercises to each other. 
we have lots of the prime equipment, so we can just, we can easily adjust things, prime. et cetera. So it's very easy yeah. for us to compare a, a free weight motion, like the cable thing to a pull down that's now has, it's the same motion, but a completely different resistance profile and be like, okay, if we change the resistance profile, does this remove that, that, that change in how many repetitions that we could get in terms of length and partials, et cetera. And it seems to. Yeah. yeah. And, and I get the. I know the full roam tribe sucks. So pardon my French. So we have the full, I, I, I'm just like, I, I don't take any side. Uh, it is, mm -hmm. I need to think broadly about the, the body and where as a scientist, my, my job is to make the field advance, proposing good questions, mm -hmm. understanding limitations. I can't downplay limitations at my convenience. Mm -hmm. As so a scientist, I cannot do that. Yeah, but I get. I agree. I gave you a straightforward answer. Can you say range of motion is better than lengthening power? I straightforward. No, and I don't. Muscle is so adaptable. It is if uh, again, if it goes back to the tension mechanism, I don't see why one would be different than another when the all the things are equated. And I, I do agree. You are not. You need to take a stance when it comes to decision make in, in practical settings. You need to make a decision based on what we have. But I, I understand it is a topic we have a lot because I have a, I'm not saying you are, I don't see you to be on very open. I don't see you as a lengthening partial tribe, but I know you have the lengthening partial tribe and the full ratio group. And it goes back to what you told me that I could not agree more. You need to, a range of motion is one variable and I have my client with a different goals and how I can take that client to that desired outcome and use all the things I know in my favor it, it is, mm -hmm. as a scientist, again, I cannot doubt playing limitations or emphasize lim limitations on my convenience. That's yeah. bias. So my, my current position stand, and this is not, has not really even changed with the current literature, is pretty much that when the goal is purely hypertrophy, is that we're just biasing more of our volume two exercises that have more of a lengthened challenge. And then when we're teaching from a coaching perspective in terms of exercise selection, it's then looking at the options that we have, like because some not everybody has prime equipment or some people don't have any machines at all. They only have free weights. They don't even have cables, et cetera. So based off of the limitations, you look at what tools do I have? And lengthened partials are a tool that you could use, right? But a better exercise is what you could also use. But also then you have to, once you get into your exercise selection process, you then have to look at, okay, if I'm targeting the chest, do I pick an exercise that's hard in the bottom and then another one that focuses on the short? Or do I pick something that's more low and then more inclined to work more? So then we look at, okay, what are the costs and benefits between, instead of doing a long and a short exercise, we do a long for the lower pecs and a long for the upper pec. And when would you choose which? And then how can you make up for what you can't fit in a workout with periodization across things. And really like it, we just work on a decision-making process, but it tends to be that, Hey, if hypertrophy is the goal, we're going to shift the scales towards more lengthened bias things. Our primary choice is better exercise selection. Our secondary choice is going to be using lengthened partials and tempo and things like that to do the best we can to accentuate the length and position when our exercise selection is limited, right? And the same thing goes the other way. When we're trying to focus on the short position, we may do short and partials or pauses or et cetera for something where it's like the intention of this exercise is to target a different range of motion than another exercise. Because the thing I want to close with is just the variability thing is that once we leave the research that's comparing the same muscle group or I mean, sorry, the same exercise or very similar exercises, we start to, I think whatever length and bias benefit there is, starts to get washed out by the specificity, right? So we have extra, we have, for example, the wide barbell press with an outward intent versus a skull crusher. And we see that, well, even though this barbell press is essentially a short and partial for the triceps, it was significantly better for the lateral head versus this was significantly better for the, the long head, et cetera. And then same thing, we look at the hip thrust versus squats, or we look at the, the recent Cassiano study where basically they took, was an RDL and a leg press, and then they simply added yep. hip thrust to it. Now there's an issue with that study in that there's an increase in volume, but if you look at the magnitude of results, it seemed like adding that one exercise 
was a greater change than the amount of volume increase. So yeah. it seemed like adding in that extra range of motion or that that different that short position challenge had some sort of complementary effect. And I think that's it seems to be that variation and specificity, which you need specificity to know that you're actually getting the variation so that you're not just doing the same thing in different places yeah. of the gym. That's one of my 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 jokes is like if you understand anatomy and stuff, you understand the difference between like actually getting variety in your training versus doing the same exercises in three different seats, you know, at yeah, the, at that's the gym. <laughs> how, again, how many people know that, right? Yeah. It, it's uh, because I agree. It, it goes back to, I always keep saying, I think as long as you have a good exercise menu that challenges the muscle with a variety of lamps, you should be fine. Not be exclusive about, and, and I think people, and that's our, our job as a, as a, as coach, professors, to teach people to do the, the good choices, right? But uh, yeah, no, it's always, again, we published like a while ago, a study with a varying exercises. We, I have, I have a few studies with a varying exercises and quite often the, the results are better when they're varying exercises. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, again, if you don't know, to, again, don't replace the same seated three, ex, three exercises. Don't do that. But as long as you are choosing good exercise for different lamps, for the same muscle group, that that would definitely uh, I do not agree more. That's a better approach than just keep sticking to one type of movement or exercise that challenges your muscle only one specific way. So last question, because I think this is probably I think it helps put things in perspective. I don't I think right now the evidence for long muscle lengths is stronger than whatever evidence we ever had for say full long. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes, or partial. Um, I but if, my... if we're comparing like, okay, how consistent is the research for there being a length and bias compared towards how consistent is the evidence for train a higher volume? How consistent is the evidence to training and, closer and to question. failure? I feel like of all of the variables that we have, this is actually one of the areas where the research is a little bit more consistent. The reason I say that is some people are very bullish about one variable and then on another one, they be like, oh, here's all these limitations. I'm like, you shouldn't be like, hey, you have to train to failure and say that that's an evidence-based thing or not or whatever, because man, the, ev the evidence is all, there's a lot of conflicting evidence here. Whereas here I see like, even though there's still limitations comparatively, there's a little, there's more consistency I find in the range of motion research. And even the variability research, I find that both of those things, it seems like man, I, th there doesn't really seem to be as much of a conflict. Everything seems to either be null or at least leaning in favor of that one thing. There's not a lot of, hey, we also have a bunch of studies that show that non-variation worked better or that shortened. Was, it seems to be fairly one-sided, but I don't think that any single variable is ever going to be extremely strong because there's so many confounders. Right. There's just so many confounders that I think we're never going to, we're never going to be able to look at one variable, whether it's volume, failure, range of motion, et cetera, and have it be like super perfect and always strong because sometimes range of motion is one thing, but the specificity or the stability or whatever it is ended up being a factor. So I'm just like, I'm not bullish with this, but I am on the fate on the side of all the things that we have. I'm slightly more confident in this than I am on, say, having a strong position on failure of volume. Mm -hmm. I, okay. I, but when it comes to training muscles that are longer lengths, I'm with you. Here, when it comes to lengthening partials, it seems to... Yeah, I'm not saying for length and partials, right? I'm just seems, saying length and bias. Yeah, when it comes to lengthening, that like when it comes to... For all muscles that are longer, but short, shorter, I, I think that's pretty cons. Despite again, despite most, I mean, say that despite the studies mostly untrained, but I think muscle is so adaptable. It, it should respond the same way with a trained. The biggest difference is gonna be magnitude of change. Definitely, it, it's more consistent there. So, with the length and partial goes back to the, my my issues. Was exercise choice? Was the the setup that causes that? And again, it, it, it goes back to the things need to improve in the field to make a defense and have a more solid 
position when it comes to length and partials. And I agree, is, if you look at volume, it's way more varied compared to longer muscle length, no? And muscle failure, and I agree there. Cool. So, I, I think yeah, I think we're pretty much in agreeing there. That's probably a pretty good place to wrap up. And I'm excited to see, like, future research. Like, I'm actually, I'm looking forward to the length and partial being debunked in an exercise like a squat or something to calm down the hype and some of the extrapolations yeah. on but that topic. people are going to say, right. yeah, but the squat at length and position is way harder. Yes. One is going to be lower. <laughs> mm. Oh, yeah. man, it's complicated. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, I but and, and to it, be honest, I, I'm not here expecting to let any partial be disproved or something like that. I just want to see more quality data and then yep. we can have a better conversations about it. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. yeah, it would be nice to see one length and any partial with his squat. I just think that's context that isn't, doesn't currently exist. And I think, I think people, they do the most, we'll say crazy and extreme things when the context is currently missing, right? Like, that's why oh, yeah. it's like whenever there's one study, People, they'll extrapolate it to all sorts of weird things, right? I think right now with the, it, like people being like, yeah, just do length and partials. There's no reason you can't do length and partials on everything. And I'm like, I don't agree with that. Right. And so I think there's areas where, where yes, absolutely. These can be, could be valuable tools, but I think that the people that are pushing it more from a marketing perspective, they're not adding in, they're not, they're not even putting out the context that, Hey, maybe this won't be a good idea on this exercise or whatever. They're like, hey, if an exercise is, if you can do length and partials, that makes it even better. Where I'm like, actually, the more length and partials you can do in an exercise means that at its core, that exercise was probably not very lengthened to begin with. So maybe you're just starting with a poor exercise choice. Yeah. Contest is not sexy on social media, yeah. right? Oh, I'm right. going to put the thing, the perspective in context. Yeah, yeah. I, I hear you. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time and giving us a sneak preview of the other study and also your analysis on the, not just the meta-analysis, but then all the limitations because yeah, that's just, that's just overlooked. And I think it really helps when that's coming from the people that are deep in the field. Cause it's very easy for us sitting in the popcorn stands to just, oh, this wasn't in the study and this yeah. wasn't in what. And I think oftentimes what happens is people forget that the people doing the research understand these limitations too, but there's a reason for them that it's not just, oh, we just, oh, we didn't care to think, or we just, we just wanted to be lazy. It's like, no, there's a reason that some of these yes. things are difficult to do. There's a reason that sometimes we can only do a piece at a time. And that's just, that's part of the research process. And I think helping people see behind the curtain helps them both understand the research perspective and also then understand like, the caution that needs to be had in taking that and applying it to their actual training. I no, man, again, thanks for having me once more. I, like you said, I, I think it's way easier to just throw the popcorn and, and, and be critic for sake of criticism. And I think we put a lot of work on what we do. I'm now always, always very res respectful when approaching other studies, because I know that the effort required. I know how much work we put towards the, the studies we do. One study cannot answer all the questions. And that's the easiest, right? The, the most common critics like, oh, they shouldn't look at this. But again, one study cannot answer all the questions. And sometimes the limitations of the study is not related to the researchers. Is what the, the, I, I always, now it's very confident they did the best they could at that moment. It is the, the same approach I have here. But uh, yeah, so I think if it would just be more respectful with each other as a whole, that would be way better and try to understand where each one is coming from. That, that, that would have helped. Mm -hmm. Drama, drama is so good for engagement though. That's yeah, right. I know. So, I know. Unfortunately, social media is, it's 90% entertainment and 10% information yeah. on these things. It's a tough thing to navigate. So I, I envy you being in the space where, you know, so yeah. Be happy you are where you are. You're not in the, you're not slinging mud w with us that actually are trying to have these conversations in 
arguably the wrong place. No, I am. I'm super happy where I am. And I, I think I made the joke, the first conversation, like uh, if I lose followers, it doesn't change my income at all. I don't care. And I don't have any obligation to be on social media, but no, I'm thankful for what I had at this point. Gratitude, right. gratitude is something I, is important. I'm very thankful. <laughs> yeah. We're thankful for you. And I, I look forward to your future publication stock. You're very welcome. Conversations. Sir. You're very if you enjoyed this episode, make sure you give us a like, subscribe, and leave us a review, and we will see you on the next episode of the N1 Experience.